Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. If you are new, my name is Chelsea. Hiya. Today we're starting a new series on my channel. I have many of them, but I am obsessed, and by obsessed I mean extremely intrigued by true crime. So I wanted to kind of smush the two together. I saw another YouTuber do this and I was like, well hell if it makes sense for her to do it, then I want to do it too. I could just talk about true crime all freaking day long, so that's what we're gonna do. For the first video, I wanted to do a, like, one of my absolute favorite ones. Not the top favorite, but, like, within the top five. I didn't want to, like, show all the goodies at once, you know? So I wanted to do a local one, and today we're going to talk about Bobby Joe Long. He was a serial killer and disgusting piece of garbage. And mostly everything he did was in Hillsborough County, which is where I live, so that's kind of why I wanted this to be the first one. Also, I have like a second degree connection to it, so we'll get into that. Um, but yeah, go ahead and subscribe, comment, like, all of those things. And in the comments down below, if you have any suggestions, let your girl know. So I already did my brows because that's like kind of difficult sometimes for me. And I'll have an, I'll try to remember to put in the description box the products I'm using, but also it's not really about the products. I just want to be able to like play with makeup and have a chance to take like cute pictures of myself. And I don't like get ready during the week ever because I work at home. So this is just like a great way for me to do all the things I want to do. Okay, so Bobby Joe Long was born in West Virginia in 1953. His parents were named Joe and Luella. He was born with a genetic disorder that gave him an extra X chromosome, which meant that during puberty, he grew boobies. He was already just set up to fail. In 1955, his parents divorced and him and his mom moved down to the Miami area. His mom worked, I believe, like two jobs. Like she was a server and a bartender, and she worked a lot, obviously, being a you know, newly single mom. She left him quite frequently with the landlord and like their family. So in 1957, when he was four years old, they were at the beach and he almost drowned because he was swimming in the water. He was like taken under the water by a wave. And later on in life, he would blame his mother for that, saying that she wasn't watching him while he was swimming and saying instead that she was like checking out all the hotties and all the dudes at the beach instead of watching him. That was just the first of many like head injury, like near death experiences that this kid has. Just a year later, when he's five years old, he fell off of a swing and his eyeball was, or like his eyelid was like stabbed with a stick. His mom and dad actually started dating again, which I'm sure was very confusing. And surprise, surprise, they ended up getting divorced again as well a few years later. He wasn't really good at the schooling. He actually failed the first grade and had to take it over again. And later on, he failed uh, 10th grade and then like re-enrolled or like dropped out twice and then went back and then like eventually was expelled from high school. But a lot more happens between then in high school. So just buckle up, buttercup. In spring of 1961, he was hit by a car and he was knocked unconscious and he had to go to the hospital because of his injuries. And then in fall of 1961, so that same exact year, he runs in front of a car and like almost dies. His jaw is left like deformed and he loses like a bunch of his teeth because of it. Not that I'm saying like this kid's dumb, but Good God, like, what are you doing? Stay out of the street, just stay inside. Like, clearly you just shouldn't do anything. Oh, and it gets worse. So the next year, when he was eight years old, he was uh, he was on a pony. Bobby, what are you doing on a pony? You and I both know you should not be on a pony. He fell off of a pony and, again, was injured. And he said that he was nauseous and dizzy for, like, weeks on end. And no, we're not done with the head injuries yet. The next year, he was nine years old, and he fell off of a fence and had to get stitches in his head. So basically just before he's 10 years old, his brain's just loose and rattling around. And I'm sure y'all probably know, but one thing that a lot of serial killers have in common is that they suffered head injuries when they were younger. Like uh, all of like the main ones basically did. Okay, also he slept in the same bed as his mother. So he has that going for him. Um, he started developing breasts, like they said before, when he was like 13-ish, like 12, 13. 
and he did have surgery to like remove like six pounds of tissue which i got big boobies like listen i get it i don't know how heavy mine are but six pounds like that's a lot i feel like this it like i feel like that's like double d's right i don't know i'm not a doctor so when he was 13 as well he killed their dog by shooting her in the cooter awful i know all of it's awful it gets way worse but he shot her in the cooter and his reasoning behind that was that he he said that he was mad because his mom was treating the dog better than he was being treated and like he was like not getting fed like as nice of food like that the dog it was like what so when he hit puberty though too he really started like resenting his mother and started being more even more so than before like more verbally abusive towards her and he slept in a started sleeping in a different bed than her and that is also i mean this is probably why but that's also when he met cynthia who would be his girlfriend all throughout middle school and high school and they actually got married he joined the army when he was uh like 18 or 19 like right when he could basically he'd already dropped out of high school by this time but he got his ged and he joined the military so in 1974 in january him and cynthia got married on the on um, the Air Force Base where they lived in like a cute little chapel. And then the next month in February of that same year, he was in a horrible, like absolutely awful motorcycle accident uh, where he like collided with a car and he was flung off of his motorcycle and he hit the pavement so hard that his helmet shattered. Now he was in the hospital for several months after that and after that it said that like because of that head injury he just started having like violent mood swings and he was very aggressive and he started he became like super obsessed with sex and he would masturbate like and then this is what the nurses said he would masturbate like six to seven times a day which it's like who has the time like what and ouch doesn't that hurt like isn't like for a guy especially like i feel like at some point your wiener just have to, has to fall off again i'm not a doctor so he also would ask cynthia to like have sex with him like twice a day and she has previously said that he like would even rape her um he was discharged from the military so they had to move off of the base and they moved to a trailer and he couldn't find a job so he had just all of this free time just filled with masturbating i guess he started being super like physically and um emotionally and verbally and sexually abusive towards her so they had one kid a boy and then they had another a girl and then finally she divorced him and he moved um away not like too far away it was like not that far from the area they lived in in southern florida so he got a roommate because obviously like he didn't really have a job and if he did it was like not a good paying job so he needed money for rent so he got a roommate and then it was this girl susan and then they got another roommate and then after that he moved out with his friend ted and then susan was like hold on i'm coming too so um susan actually like a year later i believe oh god this is awful um, accused him of rape and then the cops were like okay well there's like really no evidence to go off of so they couldn't arrest him and then the next day or not next day then two weeks later he like threw her down a flight of stairs i feel like we should just skip ahead to all of the even more awful stuff so in 1984 i have to like stop because i'm just gonna mess this up this is already hideous let's be honest so in 1984 bodies of sex workers who had been like raped and bound and then like killed and then posed in like the most just strange way like their legs were like doing a split basically they were being found all over like all over just like spread out and crazy in hillsborough county where i am and pasco and pinellas county as well so that's like the entire bay area of like the tampa bay area and he would pick up these 
sex workers and have sex with them and then drive them out it was like the same thing every time he'd like drive them out somewhere and then just rape them kill them and leave them this continued with around like eight or nine women all throughout 1984 and the cops started putting it together and obviously like they were looking for someone and it started an investigation but it wasn't going anywhere now in november uh november 3rd of 1984 basically the chunk of this happened in 1984 lisa mcveigh she was 17 years old um she let's give a little background on her um she worked at dunkin donuts and her manager needed her to work a double so dunkin donuts is open from like it, just till like midnight basically so she came from a abusive household and then went to live with her grandmother there's mo there's like different stories so one says that like she went to live with her father and then another one says that she went to live with her grandmother but what I was reading, I'm pretty sure was from her and she was saying that she left her like primary household because she was being sexually abused and then went to her uh, grandmother's to live with her. And then her grandmother's boyfriend started being abusive. And she was just so done and so low that that morning, November 3rd, she had actually written a suicide note because she was planning on killing herself. Now, fast forward like basically the whole day and she was closing up and she got on her bike and started riding her bike home and she passes a church parking lot now she sees a uh, she sees a car in the parking lot she's like that's weird it like looks like someone's in it it's like why are they just sitting there and then she next thing she knows she is being pulled off her bike and dragged into this car and blindfolded so she kind of like comes to and he has bobby geelong has taken her and he has her laid all the way down so no one can see her and she's blindfolded and in that moment keep in mind she had just decided that she was going to go home and kill herself she decided that she's going to fight for her life and that she was not going to let this guy take her or kill her rather so she can kind of see from like peeking out of the bottom of like the blindfold you know that's um like a little bit like about the car and she can like hear that it needs a tune-up and that it's older and and then also that you know the wind changes once they get off of like a normal street and they get onto the interstate or a highway and like the way like like the ride's a little bit smoother is taken by him back to his house and he brutally rapes her multiple times for like multiple hours and then she notices that he starts to like switch into kind of like a different personality. Like he's being nice to her. Like he's asking her like more about her family and he's like, it's like weird. It's like she, instead of like being like a brutal rapist, he's like, like being kind to her. So she decides that she is going to outsmart him and manipulate like this side of him. And so she starts saying to him like i could be your girlfriend like you're so sweet i know you're not gonna hurt me and again keeps switching back and forth just keeps raping her and then he starts slipping up a little bit so he takes her hands and like places them on his face and like while he's like assaulting her and she starts to like she takes that opportunity and starts feeling his face like okay you have you know a bump over here you have like acne scars over here like the, like you have a wider nose and um, you know like a small chin so again she's just in that mindset like i'm gonna be able to describe you now to the police because i'm not gonna die she tells him that she has to go to the bathroom so he walks her to the bathroom and is like standing there at the doorway and she's like you can trust me i'm not gonna go anywhere i'm not gonna try to escape but like i can't go if you're watching me he lets her go to the bathroom by herself and this is so messy um and then she starts feeling around all over the bathroom and just placing her fingerprints everywhere because in her mind she's like okay if like if the cops come here then they'll feel all like my fingerprints and then that'll be proof that i was here and he took me such a badass like ah. so then finally she again convinces him to let her go and take her back so then he does because she manipulated him which is awesome so then after that 
He also stops at the bank on the way to drop her off. And while he's in the bank, she has like a little bit of time to peek from under the blindfold and see what kind of car it is, how, you know, how old it is, what color it is, and kind of see like where they are because they stopped at a bank like closer to where they were, like to the, to the house. So he drops her off in the parking lot of the church and she sprints home and her grandmother's boyfriend beat the crap out of her because he thought that she'd like run away for a whole day. And then her grandmother was finally like, no, 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 this is, this is ending, you're done. So then she told her grandmother everything and then they went to the cops. So about a week after she went to the police, Bobby Jo Long was actually pulled over by deputies because his car matched the one that she had described. So they took him in and photographed him and then let him go, but they were surveilling him and not just like letting him go. So the next day there was a warrant put out for his arrest for the abduction, um, for him like holding her, and then also for and then also for the rape of Lisa McVeigh. And between between the time that she was like that he dropped her off and then they got her like that was hardly a week and he took someone else raped and killed her and then two other bodies were found one that he had killed um like two months before and then another one and i wasn't just picking my nose i was like itching my um inside my nostril um and then another one that they think was his first victim so there's that my like waterline is showing a lot and it's like freaking me out in the camera i apologize for my lighting as well i'm just using my overhead light right now also i'm like legit sweating because um my ring light burnt out like three months ago and i just haven't ordered a new one except for a plot twist i just ordered a new one last night and it comes friday so i'm real excited about it so starting on november 18th literally all the way until the ninth like until like the 90s he was in like the like he was like doing different trials like for all of this and trying to do like appeals and basically everyone found him guilty and then he would do an appeal again and then get a new trial and then he was found guilty again and he <laughs> again got the death sentence for basically everyone and for a little bit he did like after he um and Cynthia divorced he did move out to out to California for a little bit to get a commercial obviously before he was arrested to get a uh, commercial um like a commercial license for like driving and he he did commit pretty heinous crimes out there too but that's just going off of like what he says and what like other people say and the statute of limitations had already like gone out on that so can't really do anything about that which sucks so on may 23rd 2019 34 years well 34 and a half years after he was arrested the death sentence was finally carried out and lisa mcveigh his survivor was there she was a witness and then also the arresting officer or one of the arresting officers because i'm sure there were multiple ones one of like the main people um stephen cribb who was actually my father-in-law's best friend and one of my father's friends as well. They're not like as close, but my father-in-law's best friend was the arresting officer, which is pretty effing cool. And I never knew this until my dad showed me the Facebook post. And I was like, what? Why did I not know this? Why? Like, excuse me, sir. This is crazy. Pretty sure I've met him. Pretty sure he was at our wedding. Tony's probably kept me away from him because he knows that I would go insane and like ask all of the like not savory questions he seems pretty open about it though so i'm definitely gonna talk to him about it <laughs> um and then so he was there she was there and then like he said a few other people were there and he said he had to like pull some strings to, to get there um to be able to be a witness bobby joe long was asked ev everyone's asked when you're um, about to be executed if you have any final words and his answer was no we don't care what you have to say anyways buddy <laughs> head injury henry over here so i always say like oh no ed gein's my favorite like bobby joe long isn't my favorite which i have like three favorites really 
I'm honestly just gonna have to admit to myself like yes Ed Gein is like the OG and that's the one that like got me into true crime and like really obsessed with it but this one just has like so many like all the things and I feel like this is like a better like build up with the story than Ed Gein where it's just like he wanted to like hook up with his mom and then he like wore skin suits not that that's not fascinating, but I really do think this one may be my favorite. I just got to admit it, Chelsea. Admit it. It's your favorite. So um, the best part about this entire thing, and I really think why it is my favorite, is because Lisa McVeigh actually became a Hillsborough County Sheriff's deputy. And she obviously has like moved up since then because she like joined the department forever ago. And I just love her so much. I need to meet her. I really need to meet her. My husband's met her and I'm so jealous. Moral of the story, one, I hope you like this video, two, comment, like, subscribe, all that, obviously. Leave me suggestions, suggestions? What just happened? So leave me suggestions in the comments down below. Um, my makeup looks a little bit crazy, but that's fine. The moral of the story is always be aware of your surroundings. You're going to hear me say that a million times. Um, my husband's actually, like, way too, he's just, like, all about being aware of your surroundings all the time, literally wherever we go he always sees all the exits knows where they are and if we go to eat somewhere or like go anywhere and sit down he's like wait no can you switch seats with me i need to see the exit and i'm like you're not batman what's happening like what and then with me i point out like every single red flag like do not have me meet your new boyfriend i'm gonna point out all of the red flags like you cannot ignore those because i'm gonna bring them up every time i talk to you he just wants you to be safe okay make good decisions all right, so yeah, hope you enjoyed. I love true crime. I hope you do too. And that's it. Love you. Bye. <laughs> bye.